preseason game two for the Pacers in Houston. They get killed mostly in the fourth quarter. Some problems still there from the first game. Some stuff gone, and some players like Ben Shepard and Aaron Neesmith were awesome. And we'll talk about all of it today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today we're talking about the second Pacers game of the preseason in Houston against the Rockets. Different rotation, different guys popping, although one guy, definitely a carryover of success from game to game. Some guys slumping who are good in the first game and vice versa. And the one of the same key problems is still around and it's the defense. It's a big one. We'll talk about all of that today and more takeaways from the Pacers in Houston. Yes. I wanted to have a guest today. If you remember me saying that yesterday, but hard to find people to be up late after a preseason game to chat about these things. We'll figure that out later in the weekend. A very cool guest coming next week for sure. Any hoops. Let's talk. Pacers, Rockets in Houston. And we start the same way we started the last preseason sh- breakdown show and the way we will start the next two preseason breakdown shows, answering questions about the Pacers from the offseason from this game, right? The big stuff that's going to be very critical this season and potentially short and long term, what answers did we get to those questions today? Number one is the starters, right? The It's mostly assumed who the starting five is going to be for the Pacers this year. And four of the five started in Memphis with Tyrese Halbert not playing. Three of the five started in this game, but that's because there was a new layer to this game. Tyrese Halbert did not play uh, in street clothes once again on the bench, but Daniel Tice did play this time. So I'll be curious to get the reasoning from the team on that decision. Uh, they were both, of course, in the World Cup. So who knows? There could be any number of reasons to do that. And then Miles Turner, who did play on Sunday, did not play this time. So some tweak to the rotation expected there, and that makes breaking down the rotation and analyzing it kind of hard because you can think a lot about Rick Carlisle historically is thinking, well, I like to keep my bench group together even when a starter's out. So he'll just skip a guy from the third unit straight to the first unit. But either way, the starters for this game were TJ McConnell again at the one with Halliburton and Andrew Nemhard and his kidney stones out. The two was still Bruce Brown. The three was still Ben Mather. And I guess interchange those if you want, whatever. The four was Obi Toppin. And the five was Daniel Tice. That was fascinating to me. And that's why I brought up what I said earlier about uh, the whole bench versus starter thing. Because this could mean Tice is the top of the reserve center pecking order because he started. This could also mean Isaiah Jackson is because he was still the guy with the second unit. Although we will talk about the bench centers today because neither of those two guys were the best bench center in this game. Jalen Smith was awesome. So that was noteworthy to me that Tice started. It was his eighth game with the Pacers ever. Man, was he around the action a lot. We'll talk about him. Um, but that was noteworthy thing number one, is how the Pacers lined up to start this game with the group that they had and, and putting Daniel Tice in with that group. And then the backup five, also critical, because there's a big competition there that's been discussed, was Isaiah Jackson once again for a while until he got into foul trouble, which again is worth a longer discussion that will come later in this episode. Um, but after his foul trouble, it was Jalen Smith who was awesome. <laughs> Jalen Smith had a wonderful game. Uh, so those are two important questions. Rotation was different in those two ways from game one, but then there was also the Jordan Wara portion of this. Jordan Wara was the backup four in Memphis. Was that going to be the case? Was Jairus Walker going to climb in and take some of those minutes? And with some other absences like Halbert and like Nemhard, the 10th guy, is really the four because Ben Shepard's going to play, Buddy Heald's going to play, and then a backup point guard will play. In this case, Bruce Brown just operates as the backup one. So we saw Shepard and Neesmith and Heald again. Heald was the backup point guard for some stretches of this game, and he did pretty well in that role. He had nine assists, um, but the backup four was switched. It was Jairus Walker this time instead of Jordan Wara. Jordan Wara didn't even play, I think, until the fourth quarter of this game. He finished with just nine minutes and 14 seconds of action, and then Walker played for 27 minutes once again, although his effectiveness mainly finishing place. He still had some nice stuff with the ball um, and on defense. Uh, definitely went away. He was two for 10. So the rotation differences were Tice played and Turner didn't from the first game. And then Walker was in with the second group and Wara wasn't. But everything else was about the same in terms of the healthy guys. Smith playing well and playing on the rotation. 
came as a result of foul trouble, but I wouldn't be surprised if he earned a little bit more of an opportunity in future preseason games because of how well Jalen Smith played in this Rockets game. So that's key question number two from this game. Number three, Obi Toppin and Bruce Brown, the new guys. How did they look? Did they do anything noteworthy or really good? Well, we'll start with Obi Toppin, who had interesting notes for me this game. So he was better than he was against Memphis, for sure. That is the important lead takeaway for Obi Toppin from this game. The main thing he did well in this game to me that wasn't so much the case in Memphis was hit the glass really hard. Um, he had three offensive rebounds that were important. He also did a nice job in general with defensive rebounds. He had six rebounds total, um, but a lot of his offensive ones kept a play alive or led to an immediate putback for him and were just important for transition plays. And I never thought, I never thought of him as a nose to the ball kind of guy. He had five boards against Memphis. So I suppose it was similar, but they were more impactful this time. They led to more for the Pacers. Um, I'll clip them all, I think, tomorrow because that was something that I thought was interesting. And two of them were very early in the game. So that was a little better. Um, first bucket of the game on a leak out once again. And uh, Jabari Smith doesn't have the same kind of oomph that Jaron Jackson does, right? Jabari Smith went four for eight in this game. Uh, that who's who Toppin was guarding fairly often. He had five free throws that he made. Um, so he did a little bit better, although his defense in the second half really went away. Toppin's defense has been concerned to me. In these two games, his offense has been fine. He's got a nose for the ball. He can finish plays well enough, but his defense has been really rough to me. He's going to have to be better on that end of the floor. So did Obi look good? He looked fine. He looked like a guy that I am really looking forward to seeing now for more evaluation playing with Tyrese Halbert. We have not seen that. That is an important thing to note for any preseason evaluation for the Pacers is it may not even be relevant because the Pacers could change so much when they have their star back. Bruce Brown, uh, first of all, I was curious who he'd guard uh, between Fred Van Vliet and Jalen Green. And at first, in their initial alignment against the Rockets, he was guarding Jalen Green. Uh, that went fine at times and not so fine at other times. Jalen Green was 5 for 12, so he was pestered defensively, but he missed four threes. So he was 5 for 8 on twos. He had some nice drives. He had four assists. Uh, I think that went okay, but it's hard to tell exactly how much that was going to be the plan when Dylan Brooks got ejected less than five minutes into the game, which is so funny, by the way. I wish I covered the Rockets so I could talk about that a little more. Um, Dylan Brooks hit Daniel Tice in the you-know-whats while running through a screen Tice was setting less than five minutes in the game, ejected, first game with a new team. Um, so funny. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was not a basketball play. Uh, very Dylan Brooksy. So I thought Bruce Brown did well enough defensively. I continue to think he's doing well, like handling the ball and trying to make the right play and being around stuff. Another steal in this game, two blocks, only one turnover, two assists, three rebounds. Like he does nice stuff, but he's not making shots at all. Three for nine. He missed all four of his three point attempts. So really he was three for five on twos, which is encouraging. He's like getting into the paint, making plays, but he's not hitting the threes. The shot's not falling. That, of course, is part of the evaluation for him. So I thought he's, I think like the totality of him being able to do a little bit of everything has been on display in both of these games. But him actually being awesome or like super standout, he has not necessarily happened yet. Still, I have been encouraged by Bruce Brown and not so encouraged by Obi Toppin just yet. The rookies, one more question for every game. Jarris Walker, Ben Shepard, how did they look? Jarris Walker did not have the same kind of game he had on Sunday where he was amazing. Uh, he still was getting the shots up. Took 10 of them, only made two of them, one for six from deep. He got to the foul line four times. So he did some stat stuff. He got some rebounds. He had two assists. He was still flying around. He had a, 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 some ugly threes, like didn't get close on them level of shots. So pumping the brakes on the four for 10 from deep in the first game. Obviously, that was one game to react to anyway. But not as effective as an offensive player. I thought the defense was still mostly solid. Have to clean up some foul stuff. Every rookie does. Um, so much worse of a performance from Walker, but still a solid enough outing. He's got to make some shots, though. But he moves well. He's still, you know, disruptive on defense. It's all nice. Ben Shepard, though, followed up a good performance with a better one. And, of course, Ben Shepard had a really good start and a really good first impression against Memphis, like I said on Monday's show, if you want to go back and listen to that. This time around, Ben Shepard, four for nine, three for seven from deep, so 11 points. His shot just looks awesome. It's like the perfect form. He moves really well on the offensive end to get open. Four rebounds, four assists for Ben Shepard, and a nice block around the basket on a recovery. He looked even better. He looks really good in these preseason games. So far, I don't think there's a spot for him in the rotation, uh, but he is fighting to prove that G League assignments should not be in his future, and he should instead be 
emergency Pacers man every single game because if he can shoot like this and move around like this on offense and make some defensive plays every game, and he's got some warts defensively. I don't want to overlook that. Those have been on display in these games, but he has been really impressive, especially on the offensive end, not being disruptive, getting open, knocking down shots. Of course, if you make stuff, you're going to look good, but he has looked really solid in these games. They played them even in his minutes, which cannot be said for very many Pacers uh, in this game. And the last question every game, Ben Matherin. How did he look? Did he fit in? Did he stand out? What was he doing well? Less, he still had some of the passes, right? Caitlin clipped another one of the driving left and skipping the pass to the opposite corner passes. It's a very important read for him that he didn't have last season. He continues to make like better reads. Um, there were fewer of them in this game, but they still happened. The key thing this time, only one turnover. Oh, his handle was a little better. Didn't, and I think it was on a pass. I think it was on a pretty rough pass. Uh, I, I can't, exa- I can't remember who it was, but I'm pretty sure it was Mather and had a tough post entry pass that was stolen. Um, he was four for 10 from the field for 14 points because he got to the line five times. So this game had a lot more Mather and stuff from last year with the free throw attempts, but he cleaned up the turnovers a bit. I continue to think I actually, this is funny. I messaged Caitlin about this. So she wrote in her Patreon story about the first preseason game that, uh, Ben Mather did a good job. Fitting in while still standing out. And that is almost exactly what my header said for his section in my takeaway story. But I read hers before I published mine. So I, so I had to tell her that. Uh, we changed it. So I think that is an important like thing for him to think about this year is still being Ben Mather and adding to his game. And even though he only went four for 10 in this game, I think he did that pretty well. Lots of other players to talk about, but the key questions for this game, good Matherin stuff, good rookie stuff, not as good stuff from the new guys, and the rotation was different. And the defense, we will get to that in just a second, as well as the standout performer who did some stuff. He's getting airtime on two shows in a row. It's Aaron Neesmith. Before we talk about that, though, I got to talk to you guys about Jace Medical. We're making the Jace case that provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and all it takes to get them is filling out a simple online form, jumping on a quick call sometimes with a board-certified physician at Jace Medical. What is Jace Medical? Well, they don't want you to get caught unprepared. They think you should be empowered to take care of yourselves and your loved ones during the unexpected. And that's why they want you to be set up for that. They offer the Jace case, which provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and gives you peace of mind. So you're not just hoping you have access to medication in an emergency. You make sure you have it. In hand, Jace Medical is simple. They handle everything from the online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care so you don't get caught unprepared. Get $20 off on these life-saving antibiotics today from Jace Medical by using our code LOCKEDON at checkout at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com, code LOCKEDON. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, check out Lockdown Rockets with Jackson Gatlin, who was there for Pacers Rockets and has his own observations from the Houston side. They had a great fourth quarter to put the game away to win by the scoreline. The score not reflective of the game, the actual competitive part with players who will be playing in the NBA often this season was about a four or five point game the whole time. Um, but Jackson was there. Um very helpful to have credentialed locked on members in the gyms for these games. Let's talk about Aaron Neesmith, who was awesome, uh, and the defense and some other notes about the team. And then we'll talk more about some players in the final segment. First of all, I would like to open with this. The Pacers went, I've said this a lot, 26 and 22 when both Turner and Halliburton played last year. They were a good team. Uh, the flip side of that means if either one of them did not play, <laughs> that means they went 9 and 25. That's awful. That is an atrocious basketball team that would win roughly 20 to 25 games in a season. Well, they also didn't have Nemhard. So like the personnel they had available meant they were going to be kind of crummy today. Um, They're kind of held together by those guys. But those are also Halliburton's a great shooter and a setup guy for shooting. Miles Turner is himself a good shooter for his position. Nemhard was fine enough as a shooter and a setup man for a shooter last year. They're not only losing shooting, they're losing guys who set up good threes, right? And McConnell only had only had four assists this time. Their leading assist guy by a mile. Buddy Heald was making some good passes in this game. Um, Buddy Heald fouled out, but he had nine assists. He was making some good passes. But he's their best shooter. He should be their shooter. He was one for six from deep. They don't have the personnel because Halbert and, and Nemhard are out, and they were also missing Turner, to be a good shooting team. That is something I want to talk about from this game. They started 0 for 4. I was already prepared to be tracking their threes if they took over 50 in Memphis. And didn't shoot very well. And I wanted to see if they shot better. They didn't. 10 for 42, under 25%. And I said the same. I was talking to Brett Rush on the radio up in Fort Wayne on Tuesday. He asked me about the threes. 
And I said, you know, most of them look like good threes to me. Like they have very, have they taken very few threes that I go, oh, that's, you know, that's not a shot you want. Jarris is, Jarris Walker's taken some threes that I think were a little forced. Um, he's allowed to explore that space, but they've been ugly too. But most of the threes they're taking are like someone that I think should be taking them or it's an open shot and they just haven't gone in. Does that mean they need to take less? Maybe, but so far, I haven't really thought the quality was bad, but if they don't go in, they don't go in. And that means they probably should be looking for other shots potentially. But so far without their best shooters and guys to set them up, they had trouble with that. The other key thing from this game that will be a trend worth watching is the fouls. Whew. And this ties into their crummy defense. The Pacers at halftime of this game had 17 fouls. That's insane. That's eight a quarter. That's well into the bonus. That's going to set the other team up for an easily efficient game because they can live at the foul line. The Rockets were one free throw away from taking 40. They took 39. So it looks like they shot well from the field. With They shot 46.7%, 42 for 90. But that's because they had a lot of shots taken off the board because they got fouled on it, and the field goal attempt didn't count. Like, the, they didn't actually shoot that much better from the field than the Pacers. They just lived at the line. They made nine more free throws. They won the game by 19, but they made nine more free throws and they shot 17% better from deep. They're going to win that game every single time. So that was a brutal uh, bit of play from the Pacers, the fouls. And a lot of them came from bigs. Uh, Isaiah Jackson has foul troubles. We'll talk about him individually again in the third segment. He had five. Uh, I already talked about healed. I said healed fouled out earlier. I don't know. That was wrong. I was looking at the wrong column. Jackson had five fouls. Three of them were in like five minutes in the first half. Um, Tice had three fouls. Jalen Smith had three fouls as well. So they had a, like half of their fouls in the first half were from big men, right? They were having a lot of trouble. Uh, Jarris Walker had three fouls as well. Jarris Walker had three. Jalen Smith didn't have any. There we go. Got the numbers right now. Sorry about that. At halftime, half, half of their first 16 fouls were from big men. Right, they were really struggling with that, and that's because a lot of them were breakdown on the perimeter. Big man has to do something. Like Isaiah Jackson has to lunge out because Jalen Jalen Green's coming at him at the free throw line, for example. Or like, uh oh, Tice is not on Shangun anymore. He's defending a pick and roll. Here comes somebody right at him. And Tice had a beautiful pick and roll defensive play to start the game, the very first possession. But like, he can't do that the whole game. It's not his skill set. Jarris Walker's rookie. He's going to be out of position sometimes. But a lot of them came from breakdowns on the perimeter. Some of the way they've been defending these actions and some of their one-on-one -on -one defense has not been good, right? They said they've worked on defense. I've seen it myself, but it hasn't led to results yet. And that is the important part of this. Um, they have to, have to, have to, have to, have to be better on defense if they want to be a good team this year. And that just has not happened yet. And this game, I suppose they like forced better shots to defend, but they were fouling so much that it didn't matter at all. So the fouls have to be better. The bigs were atrocious with the fouling, especially Isaiah Jackson, who had one of those screen fouls that just kill him in his minutes. He cannot, he's got to cut those down. I mean, yeah, Caitlin, I talked about that on his season preview, but that has been tough for him is to have those illegal screen fouls. Cause he already is a little jumpy on the defensive end of the floor. Bruce Brown was also a little foul happy in this game. Matherin had quite a few as well. So the Pacers have to be better with that. 31 fouls is crazy. I mean, you're just letting the team get to the line on shooting fouls already, and they're in the bonus. So inefficient way to play defense. Pacers defense was really rough. A lot of it came from perimeter breakdowns that led to either a big man having to rotate or having to reach to stop it, or just a million different things that went poorly. Um, one other guy I want to talk about in this segment uh, is Aaron Neesmith. <laughs> Aaron Neesmith, we're going to do bad cop, good cop. Bad cop was the defense and the fouls, good cop was Aaron Neesmith, who if you made me pick a player of the game for the Pacers, I'm probably picking Aaron Neesmith. Seven for nine from the field, one for three from deep, three free throws. We talked about him drawing fouls last time. He hasn't missed a free throw yet in preseason. One steal. That's all his stats. He had no rebounds or assists. Aaron Neesmith looked so fast in this game. It was crazy. He caught one at the left slot, assessed the defender, leaned left, hard dribble right sorry that's backwards i'm looking at it from the top view leaned right hard dribble left weaved around the defender got into the paint weaved around the big hit a lap right bursted by another guy pull up drill the mid-range shot hits him like he looked awesome he was fast he was finishing plays like i don't know if he lost some weight or if he's like shifting his weight differently in his shot but it just gets up a little quicker 
I talked about him yesterday being maybe a little underrated in the way he's considered for the Pacers. Well, if he has that kind of burst with the ball, that changes his outlook significantly from like, oh, this guy could be an important 3 and D guy you want to play every game to like, oh, this guy can create enough. If he's got a crummy defender on him, he should be playing like 25 minutes a game at least. It's one game. That is not a reaction I have, to be clear. I don't think that. But if he does this consistently, then you start to think that because he did have flashes of like, wow, that was some impressive stuff. The pull-up jumpers were fantastic. The burst was fantastic. He was really, really good in this game. I continue to be impressed with him uh, in this preseason and think he just has to, has to, has to be in the Pacers rotation this year. I know there are arguments you can make for him to not be based on certain decisions, but like I always say, I would be building the Pacers rotation with him in mind and then making other decisions to keep him in the rotation. I think he's a critical piece for them and has been good in this preseason. Some other guys who are good or not good or observations about other players. We will talk about that to close out today's show, including Isaiah Jackson and his fouls and Jalen Smith, who deserves the airtime. Fantastic game from Jalen Smith as the Pacers third center in this one before we do that though of course got to talk to you guys about the great people over at FanDuel snapping NFL action this season we're rolling football's back tomorrow with FanDuel America's number one sportsbook right now new customers on FanDuel can get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet that's $200 in bonus bets win or lose if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. Their app is super easy to use, and they have a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. All your faves. So go visit FanDuel.com slash locked on kick off the NFL season. You got to go to that slash locked on to get that offer. I mentioned earlier, $200 in bonus bets. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today. And every single day for your second listen, hop on over to Locked On Clippers. Hear about the team that was in Hawaii for camp and just played in Seattle last night. And the player participation policy is coming. Are the Clippers going to play their guys? Darian Vizier will have the latest unlocked on Clippers. Who I just saw their score and decided they would be the team I talk about. Let's start this segment off with the backup fives in their games. The first Daniel Tice appearance of the preseason the first Daniel Tice appearance since like March 2nd of this year, the eighth Daniel Tice in a Pacers jersey appearance ever. What happened? Well, very first possession, I already referenced this. Rockets go pick and roll. Daniel Tice drops. He's so far below the ball handle that I thought the Rockets were going to do a pull-up long too. Instead, they throw it to Shangun, and Shangun tries to dunk on the first Rockets possession. And Daniel Tice says, nah, uh I just want a gold medal. I'm stuffing that. And he got up and got it. Uh, I don't consider him like a drop coverage master, but that was really good. He contained the ball handler. He was close enough that he didn't encourage a shot, and he recovered to Shangun for the block. That's what you want. Shangun's not fast, but that was something for Daniel Tice that I was like, oh, okay. He was always around the play with his screens. They tried to do a lot of handoff stuff with him more than they do with any other big, right? He's setting screens. He's around the action because that's what he's good at, right? The screen looked good. They were making an effort to attack the rim, and his – pick ability was crucial there i still thought he had some certainly disjointed moments like he takes some jumpers and i'm like oh i don't i don't care for that shot but five rebounds two blocks um pretty good at least like this is what daniel tice can do for you kind of game uh i thought he was the second most effective backup big of the three but good to see him out there and get a better feel for what he can be with this team and got hit in the nuts by, by Dylan Brooks, which certainly impacted his game. That was really bizarre to see early in this game. The best backup big, if I'm going to call, you know, I'll tell you a second, I got to talk about him. Jalen Smith, who was just kind of there in the first game against Memphis. He wasn't bad or good. He was awesome in this game. He had to play with the rotation guys because Isaiah Jackson had foul trouble. And Daniel Tice, for that matter, had a little bit of foul trouble. And Jalen Smith did not foul at all. He had a block. He had six rebounds, two of them were offensive, and he didn't miss a shot. He made a three, he made another jumper that wasn't as far, and he was just finishing cleanup duty right around the rim. His offensive game looked really good. He looked unstoppable, and his defense was good enough that he was like deterring guys around the basket. Pacers did amazing in his 12 and a half minutes. They won those minutes by nine in a 19-point loss. He was really, really good. He was fine. This like he has these games every so often. He had them last year, sometimes two, or it's just the ball when the ball finds him. And sometimes that can be that he has the energy and the ball finds energy. But when the ball finds him and his shots falling, he's just really engaged and connected and can stop stuff and make shots and be a force that doesn't happen all the time for him. But 
if it can happen more consistently, that of course would increase his chances of being the second best big on the Pacers this year. And that this game was one of those games where he just had the energy on both ends of the floor. His shot was falling. He was so engaged the whole time and was really, really additive to the bench groups. Like I said with Isaiah Jackson, he, before the fouls, I, I actually had a note about him before the fouls. I said, not bad, but not impressing me at all. <laughs> he was just kind of there, moving around, looking athletic. That's all great. Um, getting some boards when they come his way. Um, and then he had the fouls. They were not good. They, they they took him out of the game for a reason they had to. They were minus 18 with him out there. I will give Jackson credit. He looked much better in the fourth quarter. And I'm not talking the fourth quarter like the uncompetitive part of the game. It was like early in the fourth quarter. The Rockets had Shangoon. Amon Thompson came went more in there. Um, he had one like ugly dribbling turnover on a post up and his second illegal screen. But uh, like other than those two plays, I thought his fourth quarter performance was pretty good in terms of covering ground defensively, being helpful as a screener and rebounder. But it was late after a lot of other stuff did not go his way that game. But the backup center talk, if you're talking about somebody earning it throughout camp and, and preseason, I guess I don't know everything about what's happened in, in practices in camp. Um, Jackson has received some praise from teammates in media availability, but from the game action, seems like Smith would be the leader as it stands. Uh, but Jackson was fine against Memphis. So we'll see how that progresses in the next two preseason games. Uh, Obi, the rebounder is going to be something worth watching. That is not something I anticipated being away. He'd have a really solid impact for this team. But if Obi Topping can be this offensive rebound scoop up guy, that's important for the Pacers. I think they are not a good rebounding team. So adding to that would be helpful. Buddy Hill deserves some flowers for his performance. He found a way to be helpful despite not being able to make anything. I mentioned this already, but nine assists and like he didn't look uncomfortable as the point guard. And I say this because some of you will remember if you are an everydayer and you were tuning into Locked On Pacers in August, we were doing the international Pacers reports and Buddy Heald played for the Bahamas. They played Kansas in some scrimmages. They played one exhibition game and then they played in the Olympic pre-qualifying tournament down in Argentina. And I kept saying this. I said, the interesting thing about these games to me, from a Pacers perspective observer, is Buddy Heald is playing point guard for the Bahamas. <laughs> a lot of the time, especially when Eric Gordon's not in there, then he's really like every possession, the point guard. And it's going kind of well. He had like four or five assists almost every single game. And the competition's not the NBA, but like Argentina's good. There were some other teams they played down there that are pretty solid. And he looked good playing point guard in those settings. It's not that he's a good like throw guys open passer, but he knows how to like run a pick and roll. His shot gives him a weapon that makes him defended in a certain way that makes some passes easier. And like he gets a lot of Darren Collison assists. That's a term I used that year that Collison had like an insane assist to turnover ratio and never missed a three for the Pacers. It's like the pass that's one pass away. That's easy to like make, but he makes it perfectly in terms of timing and accuracy in a way that makes it like a good pass. Still, even though it's not like he threw that player open, he still did a good pass in a way that made the shot easier. And there, you deserve credit for that. Nine assists in this game. I don't think Buddy Hill's going to be a big time passer for the team this year, but it's good to know that with the second unit that has some flux of either who the point guard's going to be. And if it's Andrew Nemhard, who has some point guard reps, maybe not a ton, having it like, a, like Buddy Hill as a secondary ball handling option does seem a little bit important. I believe we've now touched on every player who got rotation time, except for TJ McConnell, who I have literally no notes about TJ McConnell from this game. He looked like a lot of TJ McConnell backup point guard games. Shot wasn't falling as much. Four assists. Ho-hum. TJ McConnell's a solid vet, and we know he's going to be that this season for the Pacers. Pacers don't play again until next Monday when they host the Hawks, their first home preseason game. I'll be there. Um, they have Fan Jam Saturday, which is going to be a more serious scrimmage. Rick Carlisle wanted to call it like a fifth preseason game. It's not that, but they'll have refs for the first time. They're wearing their actual game jerseys. So it's a little different than, than in years past. I can't be there Saturday, unfortunately. Uh, there'll be other coverage of that game if you would like to get more from Fan Jam. But that is the next game for the Pacers, and the next real game is next Monday. We'll have more coverage of these games like this for those outings tomorrow. Uh, a show about veteran questions, all focused on Heald, McConnell, and Tysty, 30-plus crew for the Pacers this year. Uh, we'll see about guests for that one because I thought there would be one today, and there wasn't. And then Friday, we're going to talk about the GM survey. The NBA GM survey comes out every single year. It just came out earlier today for me talking yesterday for you listening. Uh, very cool thing where all 30 GMs answer a bunch of questions about the league, the teams, the standings. 
where the Pacers included, what surprised me and did not surprise me to see in the GM survey. I'll get all that later this week or next week, the final week of camp and preseason. We finish wrapping all of that up and a cool guest coming next week. Thank you guys a ton for listening today. I'm on X slash Twitter at Tony R East. This show is there at Lockdown Pacers. Please go reply to one of the tweets I'll have on that account later today. And if you're on YouTube, comment down below who, besides Aaron e. Smith, really impressed you in this game. Thank you all the time for listening. Have a fantastic day. We'll see you soon.